here at Steve Tech. I'm Steve. Gonna start doing a series here on valve train. And so it's gonna be a multi-part series. This will be the first part of what we're getting at. And uh, the last part is probably gonna be uh, camshafts um, because the camshaft is uh, really hard to explain and a little more complicated. So what I wanna do on this episode is we're gonna talk about valve springs and the proper way of selecting your valve springs and the proper way of setting up your valve springs and some misconceived notions of what the valve spring should be and how it should be set up. Okay, So uh, this is all our uh, cylinder head setup room, cam doctor over here, uh, and this is all our spring checking equipment. So I'm actually going to show you, uh, first off I'm going to show you the difference in between these two springs. Okay, Now this is your typical, let me bring this up there, this is your typical triple spring. You see three springs in there. So it has a uh, inner, uh, inner uh, middle and outer. And then this is a dip double spring. Now this is a really high end double spring. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what these actually look like comparatively to each other. Now these are just similar springs. I don't really care about the numbers. I'm not trying to say that this spring works for your combination, I'm just showing you two comparisons of a similar spring of and, and show you the numbers and what we're going to be talking about here. All right. So, we'll start out with the uh, uh, with the oh, let's start out with this one. We'll start out with the big triple spring, all right? And you can watch the screen here run it all at the same time. Oop, I get the test button. All right. All right, and then we go through and we'll run the double spring. And then I'll show you on the graph on what they look like. Oh, darn it, get the test button. All right, now, as you can see on the screen here, so this is your great big triple spring is the red. Now your blue spring, oh, there we go, your blue spring right here is the smaller double. So just for instance, like I said, do not take anything into the numbers, that's not what we're talking about. I'm just giving you a comparison between a triple spring and a dual spring in the same range, all right? <clears throat> so you can see they're very close here within, oh, let's see here. Uh, 1,020 and 1,420 and 1,060. So within 40 pounds of spring pressure. Now, that's not the most important part. What I want you to see is, is the graph here and how that thing lays out. All right, now keep in mind, this great big triple and this spring are very close, near, nearly identical. They are slightly different. The red, the red one has just a little bit more open pressure a little bit less pressure at closed down here. Or, yeah, closed. Okay? So what you're finding out here is that we can generate the same pressure, the same curve, and this isn't the most technical explanation. There's engineers that figure all this out and have all the exact terminology. I'm not trying to give you exact terminology. I'm trying to give you good practical information. That's what we really focus on here is good practical information. Okay. What it all boils down to is you got this big heavy duty triple spring, but this little dual spring can do the exact same thing. Very close in numbers. But what makes this a superior spring is if even with this spring being uh, slightly lighter up here at peak lift, a little bit more on the seat that is irrelevant doesn't really matter but this spring is a superior spring to this spring and that's what I want to talk to you about and why that is okay so if you ever look around uh, in some of the tech stuff you're gonna find something they talk about frequency and the frequency rate of a spring and what the frequency rate means and again that might be just slightly off on terminologies here or there so 
don't need anybody coming around saying they're using the wrong terminology. Uh, we're just talking about practicalities here. The frequency rate of a spring is the weight of the spring and its ability to go back to its closed position and how fast it can do that in. Now, you take this big heavy triple spring, much larger diameter, all right? This spring physically is much heavier. It takes more energy to close to go back to its normal state, this state right here. It takes more energy for this spring to go back to this state than it does for this spring to go back to this state. That's the frequency number. What does that mean? That means that this spring has much more ability to not float and not lose control than this spring at the exact same spring pressures, at the exact same motor, exact same camshaft, everything. So these lighter, lighter frequency springs are always going to be better than what the old standard traditional triple spring is. Now this is a relatively inexpensive spring. Uh, these big high-end double springs are really expensive because they're really good. Okay, There really is nothing uh, wrong with the triple spring. I'm not saying that. They're a good, good standard system. I mean there's really not a big problem with them but uh, this is the superior spring because it has more ability to go back to its natural position that uh, fully extended position. When it does that, it controls valve much better. It's not bouncing, it's not surging, it's not doing anything else. Okay, So that's why you'd like to use uh, the lightest spring. That's also why you use titanium retainers. That's also why you use uh, lash caps, keepers, all the things that you add on the other end of this uh, all matter on this end of the spring. So that's why things are light. We're going to talk about uh, keepers, retainers, uh, other stuff here in just a bit. Okay, so the other thing that we want to talk about, because I just brought it up, was surge. So there's a big misnomer. People think, oh, I have a, we we'll just use uh, round numbers just for making things easy. I have a 700 lift camshaft and my springs are good for one inch. So if you do the math there, that means that your distance between coil bind when the spring is all the way collapsed, like what you saw here in the spring tester where it goes all the way down to collapsed, that's coil bind where it's all the way together and where it's installed at. So uh, lift goes all the way down to 700 and you have 300 thousandths there and you're thinking, oh sweet, I got tons of room, I'm doing a great thing. No you're not. You're actually doing this wrong. Now you can get away with doing that on a lot on most engines, but the higher higher end higher performance stuff, the the uh, the better that engine is, the more you need to start paying attention to some of these smaller things like what spring surge is. What spring surge is is uh, if you slow motion photography or actually high speed, you'll see the spring collapse, close, collapse, close. Well, it's also uh, if it goes into surge when it collapses and starts opening, it kind of does this as it's opening and then does this as it's uh, opening, does this as it's closing instead of nice smooth motion. And what that's from is you have too much room, you have too much room between coil bind. So the best way of setting these up to set a spring up is to be usually a hundred thousandths max of coil bind height, so you'd want it to coil bind at uh, 800 lift when you have a 700 lift cam. You'd want it to, co and ideally, you'd really want it to coil bind around 50 thousandths before that, which would make it, you'd want it to coil bind at 750 on your 700 lift cam. And what that does is, when the spring comes together, it's so close right there that when it tries to surge in the, in the transition between closing and opening, that it doesn't have any room to surge. When it's got lots of room, comes down here and makes a transition, it has all this room to start surging. And so when it's really tight and comes down close like that, it creates a nice smooth spring movement. When it comes down like this, it can 
try to go past it and surge and get all funny and then try to open it back up. So that's why you want to have your installed height 50 at minimum, 100 thousandths at maximum from what your peak valve lift is. So those are the two primary things that you want to know in your spring. Now as far as spring rates and what the uh, seat pressure needs to be, what the um, uh, over the nose pressure or the spring rate, how much it increases. That's all dependent on your camshaft and your profile. So if you get stuff from me, I'm going to tell you what spring to use. I can sell you the right spring, whatever you want to do. Um, but a lot of that stuff is all involved also with valve weight and all your valve train. So this is the valve out of one of my SMX engines. This is actually a spring out of one of the SMX engines. This is just your common triple spring right here. So uh, everything all matters on what stuff weighs. And that's what uh, in, a, in the, a Big Chief style head or my SMX head, uh, most every head that would ha have a long valve and a really large head diameter always needs to be titanium. Why is that? Because the steel is so heavy, you can't get the valve spring to control it well. So the lighter this componentry here, as long as it's durable. I mean, you can make this valve stem, you know, uh, uh, NA stuff can go like eight millimeter, uh, five sixteenths, uh, sometimes even smaller, seven millimeter. But uh, in this long a valve and in this kind of dur uh, use, that's not practical. So uh, the, uh, we want to make this as light as possible. The only way of really doing that is with material. So that uh, lightness of valve helps combine with the frequency of the spring but even if you just had a plain out heavy butt valve the best way of doing it is always with a spring that lighter sp frequency spring is doing the same thing as putting a lightweight valve in it same thing as in our hydraulic roller stuff why you always see the beehive stuff you know why you see beehive stuff smaller up here smaller retainer smaller a uh, whole entire package up here which changes the frequency rate. That's why there is a beehive spring. This spring at the exact same, same spring pressures as a double spring is better because it's lighter and has more availability to go back to its natural position easier. So this is a much better spring. So you can also run, you'd have to really figure this out and this is tough and spin trying to work and all those kind of things you can do. Um, you know, if you want to get this down to using less spring pressure, less spring, and doing the exact same thing, i.e. robs a little less horsepower. So you guys are probably figuring that out. Oh, maybe I could run less spring pressure with a better spring and get a little more horsepower. Yep, you can. Boosted world really doesn't matter. What we're looking for is maximum durability and what the best thing is. Uh, the five horsepower you gain from the perfect set of springs because they don't make as much horsepower or take as much horsepower to turn. Five horsepower is great. There's a lot of math figured out in doing that. It's going to be really tough to do in the boosted world. Horsepower is not the problem. Making stuff live is always the problem. Always remember that. But in the NA world, that's obviously something that the you know pearl stock complementary guys all work on really doing that and focusing on it. Cup, whatever. Um, so that's all really interesting stuff that you're going to find there. Um, but remember that on the valve spring, the duels and high high. Uh, high quality dual spring are always going to be better than a triple because of that frequency and then you want to set these up properly very close 50 thousandths to 100 thousandths max of your uh, lift to coil bind that way you're preventing spring surge you're making things right all right so on our uh, next video i think we're going to go over uh, push rods and some other stuff so i'm steve at steve tech and I hope you enjoyed this video.